Thank you, thank you. Uh, <coughs> so basically, I, I've been talking about Iron Maiden a lot at uh, shows, and uh, I think I've kind of reached the end of what I can talk about it since I only have one game under my belt. So I thought I'd uh, mix it up and talk about how I got here, um, like the process, how I created it, um, my other tinkerings that you can see on the screen there. And we'll go from there. I have about 20 slides, and feel free to ask questions before I, I move on. So this picture is from 1998, whenever right before the Sega South Park came out. My friend and I had this great idea to say, hey, we're gonna, let's build a pinball machine. And we took, I mean, you guys are gonna cringe, but we took a Popeye and pretty much destroyed it to uh, make this. And this was a pinball fantasy show, 1997 or 98 or so. And they had this uh, custom game competition, so we thought it'd be really cool to enter it and, and see what we did. But this ended up being a massive undertaking, and we almost like stopped being friends. <laughs> so uh, it basically it was a it ran Popeye software, and I'm trying. Man, this has been so long. Popeye software with some minor tweaks. So I basically designed a play field around the Popeye rules. And the irony of this picture is that shirt I'm wearing was given to me by George Gomez. I'm there on the left. As you can see, it's a very beautiful game. Uh, Zombie Yeti knocked it out of the park. Um, so yeah, basically we took a South Park calendar, chopped it up. Uh, we painted the play field white. It was a nice shiny white. We stuck these pictures on it, and then we say, hey, we should clear coat this. And whatever clear coat we used just turned the thing kind of this greenish brown color, and it was very ugly. As you can see, the mini play field, that's what the, the lower play field used to look like, that white. So by the time we brought it to the show, it, it was quite a sight. Uh, as you can see, it has a mini play field shot kind of like a, a a clear ramp with no sides, kind of like transporter up to the top. There's a, uh, a scoop for it to drop down to the upper left flipper. Uh, it's got this locking mech on the left. There's a drop target. You shoot it in there. That was basically recycled uh, Popeye parts. Uh, that's how all that worked. Oh, and the motorized three bank. Uh, I actually bought that. That's pretty much the only custom or uh, off the shelf part I bought was the uh, motorized three bank. You can see that dumb idea I had for the uh, the mini play field. My friend's like, you're the only one that's able to make that shot across there. And I was like, no. And then when we took it to the show, yeah, nobody could shoot that shot. So lesson learned. More, more beautiful artwork. There's the, the three bank in a down position. Uh, feeds the upper play field. There is a, uh, a huge orbit from the upper left flipper. The left ramp is from Popeye with a modified Twilight Zone wire ramp attached to it. Uh, the game shot okay. It was a wide body. And I, I, I'm not a fan of wide bodies. So I was never a huge fan of how it shot in the end. But it was it's important lessons to learn. I pretty much routed all this by hand. We did everything by hand. And it was, uh, you know, there's no such thing as P-Rock back then. So whatever whatever rules are in Popeye, that's what we had to use. And it was a, it was a challenge, it was fun, but uh, you know, I actually, I learned a lot. And from this, I wanted to try to do it again someday. And someday turned into about 15, 20 years uh, right around when uh, the P-Rock system came out, I started talking to my brother, hey, do you wanna, you wanna make a pinball machine? And he's like, no, no, I don't know. I'm busy with work, I don't wanna do it. It's, it's tedious, forget it. So I kept, I kept hounding him and hounding him, and finally he retired, and then he's like, I'm bored. Remember that pinball idea you wanna do? Let's do it. It's like, great, well, what, what should we do? 
and at the time, Archer was like season two. Uh, it was at its height of funniness. I don't know if any of you still watch it. It's not nearly as funny anymore. But we we were both really into it. We knew all the jokes. And we're like, this this the theme of this game just makes itself. Uh, we couldn't resist. So I started uh, started catting. You see, this is a first pass, and pretty much the only pass. So I had this uh, idea. I wanted a game. I wanted four flippers. I wanted just a tons of loops, ramps, everything that flows together. You know, car chase scenes. I, I, I tried just to make what I thought would be just the fastest, most interesting shots you can make. So we had all these grand ideas, like every loop, combo, ramp, orbit. Uh, it would just be some kind of you know car chase. And it was just it was just supposed to be a high energy game. This here is a shot map I made that basically took the CAD file just to make it uh, easier in the eye for when I had the uh, Archer blog. And this was actually the second version of the CAD file. Some of the shots have changed. I originally had, if you can see here, the up-down ramp There were actually uh, drop targets under it. So the idea being you knock down the drop targets, the ramp lowers, and you shoot the shooting range target in the back. That, that proved to not work very well, so that got scrapped pretty quick. And so it begins. This, this is uh, the poor man's way of making the game you know, just a visual of how the shots are going to work. So basically, I, uh, I printed out the CAD file. And I measured out, you can see there's some graph paper all over the place. And I measured out you know, some of the shots, some of the widths, just to see how I liked it. So it's basically you know, the famous Dennis Norman foam core. This was my version, which was mostly just cardboard. Uh, some authentic uh, Congo parts at the bottom here. So once I laid all this out, I was like, OK, this looks like this will work. This will be fun. And there's the, the foam cardboard mock-up of the, uh, the drop target idea I had. So there'll be a hole in the middle. You can shoot the uh, scoop in there, or you can knock down the one or three uh, drop targets to lower the ramp. Uh, the problem was the ball just kept getting stuck. Even though it, it was routed out behind it, the ball just kept getting stuck. I was like, I can't do this. I get another angle my uh, homemade captive ball area there. I had a bunch of uh, stern stickers from some event. And I used those actually for size references. You can see, I was like, OK, the spinner is this big. So that's how I, how I made my cardboard spinner. Targets are that big, same thing. Uh, the big target there for the very target. So it was just a, a convenient way of knowing I have the sizes right. And again, more of the same. Now, this is Whitewood number one. And as you can see, the only holes that were drilled uh, for the scoops and the slingshots. So this was just basically, those I knew weren't moving. And everything else uh, we did by hand. The flipper holes, we had just put these in for reference. This Whitewood never really, it, it flipped. I won't say it didn't flip. but. Um, Basically, we had flippers, but nothing else. This is basically just what we call the geometry check now at Stern. You, you put together your first white wood. Yeah, these shots work. So that's all this was. Very, uh, very bland looking, but it served its purpose. Yeah, the whole cardboard, uh, it was just. Because you can look at it in a CAD file and say, OK, that looks fun. But then when you build it in 3D, it was like, oh, I can't make that shot. So the whole purpose of the, you know, the whole cardboard mock-up is just to get a visual. You, know, you can look at the angles. Uh, there's actually, I did throw a ball around it. I mean, obviously, not very hard. But it, it was just more for a reference. And I think that's what a lot of designers do. Is because you, know, you can print it out. It's flat. It's 2D. You can't really see anything. So it's, like I said, it's just visual. 
more than anything. Here, I originally, uh, I stole a, uh, a police force uh, skill shot target, a shooting range target. So the original idea on the left side, I was gonna have a, uh, a wine glass or a beer bottle, a martini glass, whatever Archer drinks. Uh, it was gonna be a big lumbering spinner type thing, kind of like a mini me on Austin Powers. And after shooting it a few times, I was like, Ugh, this, because of the shot angle, it just didn't really work. You get like two spins. Okay, that's not satisfying. So I uh, got rid of that pretty quick. So here I am at building up uh, these ball guides are aluminum strips that I bought at the hardware store. So basically they come in, uh, I think it was three foot lengths and they're really easy to work with. So I recommend if anyone's doing a homebrew, you, you just use these, they're cheap, you bend them by hand and they can take the abuse of a pinball. So if, I don't know if anyone's played Archer in the other room, but most of those ball guides are just aluminum fabricated ball guides. Now here I started adding the right ramp. Uh, never mind the, uh, the Twilight Zone crossover ramp. That was from uh, South Park. Um, I originally had the ramp kind of doing a reverse button hook. And after shooting it a few times, I, I just didn't like it. It's just slow, boring. I wanted something different, but as you can see, it was very uh, useful. What <laughs> this is, I only did this once on this one ramp. The um, this is like a, uh, a particle board, and my brother and I just c cut it out. We uh, took some more of these uh, aluminum ball guides and made that. Uh, I, you'll see in the later slides. I found a better way. And this is a kind of a placeholder for the uh, the rocket launcher mech. Uh, this was a from a fun house. I took this. Um, it's almost like a tube that's used in the uh, the shooter line. So I used this to mock up what the you know how the rocket launcher would look, and actually I would shoot this to see if it would actually knock the ball all the way out, not into the back panel. And as you can see, one of the bigger differences you'll notice on Iron Maiden and Archer is the no drop targets. And what this did was it gave me more room here for a very target and this the, the uh, mini loop. But it would, the, uh, it w I don't know, I just didn't like the way it shot again. So that's when why when Iron Maiden came around, I decided to put drop targets there and just kind of make these shots a little tighter but I think in the long run it was worth it. Now you see some really rough prototyping of the uh, right ramp. We've got some wire form coming down here and this ugly little plastic um, little drop off ramp here. So I found that uh, I got a sheet of acrylic from Home Depot for like five bucks. And this was a great way to uh, prototype the ramp that's much better than the, the wood here. So basically, just cut this out. I think I used uh, just the, the jigsaw with um, the metal blade. Cut it out to the shape I want, use the, uh, the aluminum guides and a lot of duct tape. It, it works. So as you can see, I mean, it looks terrible, but when you're just prototyping the shot and the ramp and how you want it to work, it, it's great. Here's the, uh, the drop target mech I was trying to do for the center ramp. As you can see, there's a kind of a, a hole back here, so you can shoot it. You can thread the targets into the scoop, or you can knock down the one and three targets to lower the ramp. And like I said, it, it just didn't work how I wanted it to. So that got the ax really quick. And here is a picture where I, st I put the very target. Now this was a challenge. I know a lot of you have played very targets on safe cracker and the ball just it just gets stuck it it just gets stuck so I tried everything I could including putting a Newton block from Metallica on the very target which actually made it some great kinetics but it's it still it would not stop the problem of just gravity grabbing the ball right here 
and not letting it go all the way down in the hole. So I struggled with the very target for some time, tried different angles, attached different things to it. Now, it's still on Archer, but uh, when it came time to do Maiden, it, it just it was going to be more trouble than it was worth. So that's why this became just a uh, stand-up target. It wasn't cost-cutting, like everyone said. Now here we start uh, building the wire ramps. So we, uh, we made these custom uh, little wood blocks with our measurements, and we slid the uh, rods in there. We used uh, plumbing solder, the silver solder, and a torch. And amazingly, that works great. Those ramps have been on there for thousands of plays in there, and they're still in one piece. So again, if you're doing any kind of prototype ramps, I, this I know they, I talked to uh, Mark with the uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, and he, he swears by it. And I agree, I've had not a single problem with these. Now you can see the left ramp's now in, and I fully made that out of the uh, Delexan sheet. And then that, uh, sorry, I was looking at the wrong ramp. Right here, just a long sleeve of plastic, two sides, some glue and some uh, little ribs. And that lasted through the entire first show we took this to. It was a really smooth ramp, and I, I don't know, I kind of miss it. I kept it for the longest time. It was the first complete prototype ramp I built. You can also see the, uh, the way Archer feeds the, uh, the rocket launcher here to the uh, VUC, and the up-down ramp here. Now, I cheated a little bit the play field is about an inch longer than a, a standard play field. So I cheated a little bit, which then took the ability away from me to load it the way I do in Maiden, which is behind the back panel through here. So in reality, when we went to Stern and we uh, put the play field back in a, a standard pinball size cabinet, um, it actually gave us the, build, the ability, which I originally wanted to do, was have the ball feed back through here. Uh, any questions so far? I know this is riveting. <laughs> now here's my least favorite part of the project, the wiring. So now that I work at Stern, I, I appreciate the cabling department more than ever because this was a pain. So I had two different wiring harnesses. I had one from the Congo and uh, episode one. And I tried to use, I tried to wire it, because this is using a P-Rock with a uh, Valley driver board. And I was trying to keep with the wire colors that they used. So I s stripped all these wires out of here, matched them up, put them in bundles. And it was just a freaking nightmare. A lot of respect for the people who actually do this for a living now. It's just the routing, uh, certain wires can't go by, the optics can't go by solenoids. There's all kinds of things you learn when doing this. So, and like I said, never again. Again, more uh, wiring mess. Ah, the prototype uh, rocket launcher, AKA sarcophagus. So I ended up using the, uh, the original could lock two balls, and it used optics. And I don't have a picture of it, but underneath is all this is is a pinbot visor motor. And it lifts the mechanism up and down with a off-the-shelf um, hinge right here. Now this was just supposed to be a prototype. I, I never expected it to last very long, but it's still in there working now. Um, I never really had to redesign it. It worked great, and I. Yeah, that's my favorite mech, my first mech I designed. Now this is the second white wood where we started having some inserts. Uh, the right ramp now uh, but button hooks around to be a lot faster than the original was, which was very slow. Now this is when we first dropped the play field. So my brother was actually developing the game, working on the software and just basically an empty cabinet. 
So this is the first night we dropped the play field. Uh, it's a second white wood into the cabinet. And he, he did all the display work. He uh, wrote all the system stuff himself. So this was kind of an exciting night for us to actually play the game that we've been working on for like two years at this point. Uh, just again, just more iterations of um, the center ramp. I uh, tried having it go through this guy here. I was like, hey, that'd be cool if he shoots him. If you shoot him through the chest, it drops down into the bottom of the, you know, the subway. But it, again, it didn't work as well as I would like. So I thought uh, I'd come up with something different. Oh, these are a little out of order, sorry. So for the inserts, we used a, um, on the second whitewood, it was just one sheet of plastic that we uh, lasered to fit uh, the the uh, routing here, and we, oh, you know, they're nice and diffused. This is great, and we went with it. And then when we put clear coat on them, the uh, inserts turned clear, and you can just see right through them. So uh, that was a mistake, but yeah, it works. It's a lot easier than trying to buy an off-the-shelf inserts. Again, building more stuff. The left ramp here, the uh, the little button hook. I uh, had a car attached to it. We're going to have it uh, on a motor. So when he goes around this ramp, it, the car's spinning out. Uh, it was going to be some cool effect. But then uh, we, there's just no room for it. So it ended up a car on a spring, as if you will. The prototype for the, uh, the bullseye. So basically all this was some Lexan keyboard switches. So we got the bullseye, middle, and the two outer. This worked very well, and it is still still in the game. It just hasn't broken yet, which I'm surprised. Uh, they had a lot of problems with the wires breaking off in the back. So when we did the uh, bullseye target on Maiden, we ended up using spoon switches with the metal plates, and they were much much more robust. We tested them for you know a million cycles of balls smashing into them. We didn't have any problems. So. Um, Definitely went recommend that design over keyboard switches, which suck. Here we are getting some lights. So we're taking some beauty shots of those. These uh, inserts, basically just uh, clear overlays, like an overhead projector. I just printed those out and clear coated them on there. As you see, they just say mission one, mission. It's we didn't really have any direction with the rules at that point. It was more about building. Here it is, taking uh, artwork from the show. I would just download it, print it out on the uh, transparency, and then spray the back with a white, kind of a lacquer plastic paint. And this actually, it was very, it a very good light distribution through the art. Krieger's band, uh, that's, he had so many different bands, I had to pick one, so uh, I got some uh, water slide decals in the van and decided just, I had nowhere in mind to put it, so I just kind of stuck it over there in the corner, and that's where it's been ever since. Getting the uh, arch ready for that first show we took it to, so we had to make up these... Uh, this is a poor, uh, poor Congo apron. For those wondering why I destroyed a Congo, I didn't. It was already destroyed. So it was basically a board in an empty cabinet and a couple uh, play field parts, including the arch. See, I was mocking up the, uh, the back glass for our first, actually our second show, sorry. Okay, this is, I'm still frustrated by this. Um, so this was supposed to be, I used to work for a, a company that did, uh, we would get custom like headers for video games and they used the, the, the transparencies. And I thought, okay, I'll just, I'll just use these guys. So I made this art print and I sent it to them and they, like, this is like literally a couple days before the show, 
and they, just, they took them a week, and then they came back to me and said, oh, we can't do that, it says Archer on it. So I ended up, they would ran the uh, transparency for me, minus everything in the middle here. So what you're looking at here is not what's in the game right now. All this had to come out and be replaced by basically just a poster. So if, you look, if you're wondering, if you're looking at the back glass and wondering, that looks strange, that's why. So it, instead of just a one nice transparency piece, it's a poster with the transparency. Again, we're taking it to the show. This is my brother uh, sanding the uh, Congo art off, giving it that lovely black cabinet look. So the spinning car got replaced by Archer. <laughs> There's one scene from one of the shows where they're, they're shooting at each other, so I tried to uh, duplicate that. And we've got little Archer action figures and the bad guy. And they're both on springs, so if you, if you shake the game violently enough, you'll, you'll see them move around a bit. Now the final stages, like I said, these are out of order, sorry. The uh, ramp making, here we made a little keyhole for the uh, ramp exits. This stuff, this is a uh, copper brazen rod, which is very hard to work with. It's very pliable very springy, and we had a lot of trouble getting this keyhole right. And a lot of us got cut, uh, this thing uncoiled on him and snapped on his finger, so we were kind of in a bad mood by the time we got these ramps done, but they work and they're still together. And here we are with the, uh, the all the bends, as you can see the, uh, the silver solder, plumbing solder. Here we are test fitting the ramp, it works, then we painted it black to make it a little less ugly. And there it is in place, and this was the last time I have worked on this game. This is the night before we took it to um, Pinagogo. And right after Pinagogo, I got contacted by uh, George, and he's like, hey, I wanna see this game. So that's kind of, the state has been in since. Someday I would like to go finish it. There we had a third Whitewood planned uh, someday I would like to revisit that, but now that I'm busy doing this for actual work, who knows? And that is it. So, any questions? Uh, Iron Maiden related or otherwise? It took about two years. Uh, we. For him, it was kind of a weekend project. He'd work on it a weekend, sometimes late at night. Uh, for me, I usually would, it was very relaxing for me to come home after work and work on it for you know an hour or two. So basically, you know, not every single day, but there were probably a couple thousand hours into this, yes. And that was just on my end. Yeah, uh, so Jason Sudeikis, uh, he's a friend of mine, and we would hang out at uh, 82 Arcade in LA. He came up to me one day and he's like, dude, H. John Benjamin, he wants to do a pinball, he wants to do a pinball. I showed him yours and he loves it. He wants to, you know, if this goes into production, he wants to do the voice. And I was like, ah, no, we're not doing it as Archer. He's like, ah. So, yeah, H. John Benjamin saw it. I don't know about anybody else on the show, but he definitely saw it and I, I, I thought that was awesome. So the question is, uh, yeah, when George hired me, he, he called and he's like, all right, here's a couple of licenses, what do you think? And then I told him what I thought, and then he called me the next day, he's like, well, how about Iron Maiden? And I honestly, I, I hadn't listened to the band that much and I was like, okay, I'll think about it. And then he called me back. We got Jeremy on art. And I was like, okay. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And so I kind of looked at the mechanisms. And I was like, I, I think I can, I can um, theme, you know, I can theme this layout to Iron Maiden. And 
I think I think it worked out well. I mean, the sarcophagus was perfect for the rocket launcher. Um, the only thing that, honestly, in my opinion, that maybe a little stands out a little awkwardly is maybe the bullseye target, but you know, it it, it looks fine. I was happy the way it came out. So this will be my first game where I'm kind of, you know, I'm designing the, the play field around the theme instead of the other way around. So I'm really excited for my second game. Um, it's pretty much in the can design-wise. Right now I'm working on the rules. And it, I, we just had a meeting and found out what assets we're getting. So it, it's, I'm really excited for my second game. It's going to be fun to... I just may, I don't know if this has been done before, but basically the rule set was, I had a kind of a base rule set in mind when I designed the game, rather than design the play field and then try to think of a rule set later. So that, the lessons I learned, in the, wasn't really a lesson, but it's, it's just gonna be, I'm, like I said, I'm really excited to be able to um, say, it. I, you know, like an archer, it's like, well, how does that, how does that fit in? How does that, uh, relate to Iron Maiden, and you know, I would stay up late at night racking my brain about that. Where now I don't have to worry about that. I was like, I'll, I'll think of a rule, and they say, okay, now I'll think of a cool device to go with it. it it's that, not really a lesson, but uh, just more, yeah. So I've been using, uh, so the question is, uh, CAD software. I've been using Illustrator for years. I used to do websites. I've done flyers, stuff like that. So the original, um, yeah, the original was done in Illustrator. I had all the Illustrator files when when George hired me. He said, "Well, we're gonna, we're gonna have to get you used in our software." It was it was pretty easy transition. So it, pretty much any CAD file in any uh, vector program. It was it was just basically learning the keyboard commands, which was the tough part. Anything else? I think so. Um, uh, this will be an experiment to find out. I mean, I can, I can relate to the software guys when uh, they have a play field handed to them and, and the designer says, okay, do something fun with this. So um, I thought, okay, this will be a nice way to find out, hey, if I actually design the play field around some important elements in mind, hopefully the whole package will be more co cohesive and go, you know, get done quicker. We have another update planned, yes. A lot of bug fixes, a couple tweaks to scoring, and some more light shows. <laughs> so my, uh, my tournament experience in designing a game, I'm not sure that really applies other than to you know, score balancing the rules. So I I played the game to death when it was first playable, and I you know I'd invite Zach and Tim. I said, hey, what do you guys think? Is this too much? Too little? So I think there are enough guys at Stern now that who play in the competitive circuit that I, I don't think you're going to see too many games released nowadays with glaring you know scoring bugs, exploits. So it's exciting times now. Absolutely. Uh, that might not be in my my control. <laughs> yeah, I I wasn't, you know, Archer wasn't designed with an action button, and Iron so Iron Maiden didn't have one. But I, as a start button on location, they're great. Uh, so it's all up to what the programmer does with it. You know, 
I, I can't help that. How do I feel about upper and lower play fields? Um, I'm not the biggest fan. I think if you're going to ask me my all-time favorite upper play field is going to be Whitewater because the ball just it goes in there, it goes right back out, nice flow. Uh, other than that, I'm not the biggest fan of them. I, I won't say I'll never do one, but I, I don't plan on anytime soon. Yeah, so originally, when we took it to the first show, we had um, MPF, and it, the, the game had a video mode, the uh, Krieger uh, YYZ video mode. Uh, my brother had a lot of problems with it, and he switched to Skeleton Game literally a month before we took it to another show. So he ported all that stuff over. He didn't have time to get the video mode ported over, which is a shame because it's great. Um, so yeah, the Skeleton Game is running right now. Any other questions? <laughs> Bigger, <laughs> more. So Steve's office is right next to mine. And so, as you know, he, he, he's a little hard to hearing. So when he wants to listen to his music, I, I can hear it. That's, that's what I'm going to say for Steve. But Steve's a great guy. One of my first days in there, he, he took me in and he's like, hey, any questions? Let me know. Yeah. I'll, help, I'll help you. Your game's great. That's the first thing he said to me when I started there. So your, your game doesn't suck, which uh, at Stern, that's considered a high compliment from him. Any other questions? Yes. I was about seven or eight years old. Um, so I grew up playing like right when solid states were taken off. You know, I used to play Frontier, Black Knight, Firepower. Um, I didn't, you know, I would, if there's a free put it on a uh, EM, I would play it. But if not, I mostly stuck to the uh, solid state games, Flash Gordon, Skateball. The, the, the elements, there weren't really that many elements in Archer. There's one, one thing I did take, which was from Solar Fire, um, where the letters are scrolling, and you, you hit the uh, target, and you spell things. When you get to the second level, Mummy Multiball, I copied that. So you, the mummy letters are scrolling, and you have to actually spell it. If you hit one that's already flashing, you don't get the letter. That, that's an element I definitely stole from a, an old solid state game. But other than that, I, not too much. Other than that, I've been a huge fan of spinners, and that's that comes from all the the, the spinner games I played in in the day. So every game you'll see from me will definitely have at least one spinner. So the question is uh, basically pinball collecting versus uh, public bar people. Yeah, see, I think this license, it really divides people. You know, just people, oh, I hate their music. Or people's like, oh, I love their music. So yeah, I, I, get, I get both. So I knew this was going to be a little bit of a challenge. So what I tried to do is just make a game that had a lot of depth, but approachable for a novice player. So when you're first playing Iron Maiden, there's you can do really well just by shooting the bozo shots up the middle. You know, you get your mummy multi ball, you, you get your Eddie letters, you start the modes there. But as the game progresses, those start going away and you have to start shooting the outer shots. So I was, by designing the game that way, I was hoping that the casual player could at least feel like they got their money's worth and would keep playing it rather than this music sucks, I don't like this game, I'm playing something else. So
that, that was a plan from the get-go because we have these new LCD screens. So the question is about the, the tutorials that are in Iron Maiden. Uh, we have these LCD screens, and when the game's just sitting there in attract mode, so if you, you go to a bar and you see Buck Hunter sitting there, is it just, you know, it's not just going through high scores, it's actually showing you how to play, it's showing you scenes from the game. So we, ha we had the idea, okay, we'll, we'll put this tutorial in just to help people. And also, if you notice Iron Maiden sitting in attract mode, it's, it's going through like different screens of the game, you know, that's to pique people's interest. It's like, oh, what mode is that from, or you know, what's that from? It's kind of like you know, like you see in a video game attract mode. So that was that was all that intention. You know, just give it more luster when it's sitting in the bar rather than just going through scores. No, because he, he was never in. I never saw him. Hey, Jerry. Anything else? Uh, hopefully Expo next year. All right, looks like I'm getting kicked out of here for these other stern guys, so. One more. Kind of a mix of flow and stop and go. I think it's important to stop the ball sometimes. Um, if you were to ask me personally what I would love, it would just, yeah, flow, flow, flow all day, Steve Ritchie type, you know, ball's always on the flipper. But I realize that, you know, the casual player, they're probably not going to, they're never going to look up the screen when you do that. So I think it's important to have a balance of both. All right. Thank you.